Hi, I'm Pastor Kerry. Hey, before we get started, I want to encourage you to make sure you've got a few things on hand. First, I want to encourage you to make sure you've got a set of the sermon notes. If you don't already have them, you can go to the link that's right down below the video. It'll take you to a place where you can print a set of the sermon notes for yourself. I also want to encourage you to make sure you've got some communion elements. You'll want to have some bread or a cracker. You'll want to have some juice or some wine. Really, any beverage would suffice in a pinch. But you want to have those communion elements because here in about 20 minutes when we get to the end of the sermon, we'll move right into a time of communion with you. So, if you need to print the sermon notes or if you need the communion elements or if you need all of the above, I would encourage you to press pause right now. Go ahead and get together whatever you need. Once you've got everything in place, then go ahead and press play again to resume the playback. So, how has your week been? <laughs> the reason that I asked that question is because for those who weren't aware, it's been quite a week for me and it's been quite a week for South U Christian Church. About a week ago, I tested positive for COVID and this is the first time that I have come down with COVID-19 since the pandemic began. Thankfully for me, my case was very mild and I bounced right back. I feel like I'm 100% recovered at this point, and I'm very grateful to all of those who prayed for my recovery. But I'm not the only one from the church who came down with COVID over this past week. Unfortunately, right now, this church, South U Christian Church, has more people who have come down with COVID at the same time than at any point over the past two and a half years since the pandemic began. I don't want to go through the whole list, but uh, we've got a whole bunch right now. And so our church leadership has made the difficult, but I think very wise decision to suspend all in-person activities here at the church for the time being. Uh, that is why we suspended our in-person worship service this coming Sunday morning, July 31st. Those of you who are faithfully, uh, view, faithful viewers of these online sermons and communion services every Sunday morning, there are a lot more people that are joining you in viewing this online sermon and communion service this morning since we aren't having an in-person worship service down in the sanctuary today. So, we've had all of that going on. In addition to all of that, yesterday morning, I got up and was greeted by a text from one of our church members saying, Hey, Pastor Kerry, did you just text me from a different cell number? And I said, No. And about the time that person had finished texting me, then I got a phone call from another church member saying, Hey, Pastor Kerry, did you just text me from a different cell number asking me to go buy some gift cards? And I said, no, absolutely not. And about that time, I got a call from another church member saying, Hey, Pastor Kerry, I am getting ready to go and buy those gift cards, but I thought I ought to just call you on your other cell number, and I ought to just double check. That's you that I've been texting with this morning, right? And I said, No, no, that has not been me that you have been texting with. There is obviously someone out there who's trying to scam our church members. Do not go and buy any gift cards. And so as best as we can figure, there must have been someone who got a hold of one of our church directories and decided yesterday morning to just start texting church members. The scam was they were asking people to go and buy physical gift cards and then to text the numbers off of those gift cards back to them. Now, as far as we know, nobody fell for it. We got the word out as quickly as we could. We contacted law enforcement, but if you God forbid if you did get scammed or if you know of anybody from our church that got scammed, please reach out to us and let us know so that we can inform law enforcement. I'm hoping and I'm praying that nobody did get scammed yesterday, that nobody fell for it. So, like I said, how was your week? <laughs> All of this has been going on over the past six or seven days. And on top of everything else, today is my wife's and my 21st wedding anniversary. And so, happy anniversary, beautiful. I'm looking forward to the next 21 years with you as well. My wife actually asked me 
a couple of days ago. Uh, she said, hey, someone just reached out to me and wanted to know if we could, uh, if they could get us a gift card for our anniversary. And I said, I don't know, do they make gift cards that would work for a real life functioning time machine <laughs> that would allow us to go back in time? And uh, should we go back a week? Should we go back two and a half years? How far back, honey, do you want to go to try to avert some of the craziness that we've been experiencing over the past who knows how long? Unfortunately, as far as I know, there is no such thing as a real life time machine. And so I think we got a gift card to a restaurant instead. But thank you very much to the, the loved ones who got us the gift card to the restaurant. We will put that to good use. Folks, I have spent the last six minutes of my 23 minutes and 46 seconds just telling you about all the drama that's going on out there right now. I really ought to get to this sermon, shouldn't I? Well, let's do this. Without any further ado, let's take a look at our lectionary passage. The lectionary passage is Psalm 85. For the director of music of the sons of Korah, a psalm. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but the, let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. May God bless the reading of the beautiful and majestic word. So, this is the 85th Psalm, and you might have noticed right from the very start that something was a little bit different. Typically, when you think of the Psalms, if you're like me, you think of them being ascribed to David or perhaps being attributed to Solomon. In this case, the 85th Psalm is attributed to the sons of Korah. So, if you're wondering who were the sons of Korah, well, we should probably talk about Korah first. We know from Numbers chapter 16 that Korah was a cousin of Moses. So you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, Moses, Korah, they were cousins, so they were probably best buds. Well, no, <laughs> they weren't. As a matter of fact, Numbers chapter 16 tells us that Korah actually organized a revolt against Moses. And we're told in Numbers 16 that God put down that revolt in a pretty decisive way. So, it's interesting, at least it's interesting to me, I don't know about you, but it's interesting to me that the sons of Korah, and of course these would not have been the literal sons of Korah, this would have been many, many generations later. So these great, 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 great grandsons of Korah, that they appear to be redeeming the name of Korah. Many generations after the great, 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 great grandfather's uh, failed revolt against his cousin Moses. There are a total of 11 psalms that are attributed to the sons of Korah. This is one of them, obviously. So let's very quickly talk about the setting of this psalm. Most Bible scholars, most theologians, best guess is that this would have been written around the time that the Hebrew people who had been in exile in Babylon, that they had returned to what had been the nation of Israel, that was now kind of a, a heap of rubble. And now they're trying to restore the nation of Israel. You probably remember from books like Ezra and Nehemiah that they tried to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem and then they tried to restore Jerusalem first and then they kind of tried to build outward from there. And that is basically what happened. 
uh, through the remainder of the Old Testament. But what I want to do right now is I want us to focus on four of the recurring themes in this psalm, and I want us to ask ourselves questions based on the recurring themes in this psalm. We're going to have to get through them quickly. There are four questions that we're going to ask ourselves today. Those of you who see my sermons every week, you know that typically there are three questions or three points of application. A couple of weeks ago, I think there were only two. So we'll call this a makeup from a couple of weeks ago that we've got four today. But I got to get through them fast because I've only got about 13 minutes left to get through the rest of the sermon and through the time of communion. So let's talk about those. Here's the first question I think we should ask ourselves based on this song. As people of faith, what would we want God to restore today? As people of faith, what would we want God to restore today? Now, I told you that we had some recurring themes, some recurring words in this psalm, and one of those recurring themes or words is, in fact, the word restore. In fact, I'm going to pull out my handy-dandy yellow highlighter, and I'm going to show you where it mentions the word restore right here in verse 1, and once again in verse 4. See that right there? (laughs) Lord, show favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. Skipping down to verse 4, restore us again, God our Savior. So the sons of Korah are asking for God to restore the land just the way that the land had been restored previously under Jacob. And look, that is a perfectly reasonable thing that the sons of Korah asked for. And I think that for us in the year 2022, are we wanting God to restore uh, the, the nation of Israel? Well, certainly we want what's best for the nation of Israel. We want what's best for all nations. But I think when we take a look at what's happening in the world around us right now, is there something else maybe in the year 2022 that we'd like to see restored? Friends, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to say our world has been turned upside down over the past two and a half years. And I don't think it's unreasonable for us to say to God, God, could you please restore to our world some semblance of normalcy? Could you please restore to our world something of the stability that we knew just a few years ago? Now, does that mean that Everything will be magically transported back to what it was in the year 2019? No, it won't. The world is permanently different. There's no question about that. But I think it's okay for us to say to God that we would like to have some semblance of normalcy restored. And so I think it's okay for us to ask God for that. And friends, on a personal level, I don't know about you, But I think that it's also okay for us to identify something in our individual lives that we would like to have restored. If you've got a broken relationship right now with someone that you would like to have that mended, I think it's okay for you to say to God, God, could you please mend this relationship? Could you please help me to mend this broken relationship? Whatever it is that you'd like to see restored, talk to God about it. So that is the first question that we should ask ourselves. Now, what's the second question we should ask ourselves? Well, it's this. As people of faith, what does salvation mean to us today? As people of faith, what does salvation mean to us today? Because in this passage, the word salvation is another word that occurs a couple of times. So I'm going to use now my handy-dandy orange highlighter. I'm going to show you in verse 7 where it The sons of Korah say, show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. And then again in verse 9, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. So right there in the orange, we've got salvation as a recurring word, as a recurring theme. So, look, you know what salvation means to us as Christians. The fact that we are saved through faith and that someday we are promised eternal salvation. And that is a beautiful thing that we have as disciples, as children of God. But friends, I think that all of us should probably ask God as well, God, is there something that you want us to try to save in the world around us? Because friends, I think that as we look at 
what's happening in the world around us today, there are some things where we could probably take some action to try to save the situation. And friends, <laughs> I could probably give a whole sermon on this, and I just don't have time right now, obviously, but I would encourage you just to be thinking about what can you identify in the world around us where we can be involved with saving that person, saving that situation. Friends, I would encourage you to talk to God about it. I'll tell you that for myself personally, and I, I don't want this to sound political, please understand. I just want you to know that as I look at the world around us right now, it occurs to me that the world is hotter than it has ever been or at least it's been in a long, 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 long time. And friends, it hits home for me personally because this past year, just within the past 12 months, my home state of New Mexico had the largest forest fire that it's ever had in the state's history. And the church camp that I go, grew up going to every summer, the church camp where I was baptized as a child, was severely damaged by the largest wildfire in the history of the state of New Mexico. I know that for myself, I would like to ask God to help me and help us to save this world that is hotter and hotter every year. It's not getting better, friends. So that is the second question that we should ask ourselves. And again, please don't take that politically. That's just a statement of the reality of the world that we're living in in 2022. The third question is this, as people of faith, how do we demonstrate faithfulness today? As people of faith, how do we demonstrate faithfulness today? So let me get out my red handy dandy highlighter and let's highlight the places where the sons of Korah mention faithful or faithfulness in this passage in verse 8, in verse 10, and again in verse 11. Verse 8. God promises peace to his faithful servants. Verse 10, love and righteousness meet each other. Verse 11, faithfulness springs forth from the earth. And so what does faithfulness look like for us today? Well, obviously, we want to be faithful to our God. Obviously, we want to be faithful to one another. But we live in such a complex and such a complicated world. What does faithfulness look like in this complex, complicated world that we're living in? It means that we continue to let people know that we are guided by our faith in God, that we are guided by our beliefs, that we're guided by our values. And friends, look, we need to continue to let people know that in a world where you can be friends with anybody, any random stranger, <laughs> that we are faithful to the people that God has placed in our lives, whether that's our families, whether that's our church, whether that's our workplace, whether that's our neighborhood, whatever communities we find ourselves in, we want to be faithful to the people that God's placed in our lives. We want to be faithful to God, and we want other people to see that. That is the third question that we need to ask ourselves. The final question is this. As people of faith, how do we exemplify righteousness today? As people of faith, how do we exemplify righteousness today? Well, it just so happens that righteousness is another recurring word that the sons of Kor included in this passage. Now I'm going to use my blue handy-dandy highlighter to highlight where in verse 10, the sons of Korah say that righteousness and peace kiss each other. Verse 11, righteousness looks down from heaven. And verse 13, righteousness goes before God. So there you have it. <laughs> so what does righteousness mean to us in this day and age? Friends, look, you and I are called to do what's right at all times. Does that mean that I always do what's right? No. I will be the first to admit I don't always do what's right. And I wish that I was better about that. I'm trying to be better about that. Do you always do what's right? I'm going to assume that you probably don't either. And I'm going to assume that you probably want to do what's right, that you try to do what's right. 
And so the question we need to ask God is, God, what's the thing that you want me to work on right now? How can I be more faithful? How can I practice more righteousness in my life? Because God, I want to do what's right. I want to do what's right by you. I want to do what's right by the people around me. I want to practice more righteousness in my life. And so friends, as we contemplate what the sons of Korah have shared with us in this beautiful psalm, in Psalm 85, what we should probably do then is think about what those things meant for Jesus. What did it mean for Jesus to restore the broken relationship between us and God? Well, it meant the cross for Jesus. What does salvation mean for Jesus? Well, we know, of course, that Jesus accomplished salvation through the cross. What did faithfulness mean for Jesus? Jesus was faithful to the mission that God gave to Jesus. And what does righteousness mean for Jesus? Well, we know that Jesus led a perfectly righteous life. And so, friends, as we prepare now to move into our time of communion, and as we gather around the proverbial table together, I just want to remind you of the Apostle Paul words recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so right now, I would encourage you to go ahead and take your communion elements as I get my communion elements. And as we prepare now to partake of these communion elements together, the body of Christ, broken for us. Let us partake in remembrance of him. In the blood of Christ, shed for us, let us drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this beautiful song that we have been able to study together this morning. We thank you for the sons of Korah who shared these poetic words with us. We thank you for the fact that all of these qualities that we focused on today were exemplified by our Savior. God, help us to continue to discern how to put these principles into practice in the crazy times that we're living in, in 2022 and beyond. God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, once again, thanks for joining us today. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time.